أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي لا يبلغ مدحته القائلون ولا يحصي نعماءه العدون ولا يؤدي حقه المجتهدون الذي لا يدركه بعد الحمم ولا يناله غوص الفطن ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب قلوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا والشفيع ذنوبنا سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد محمد وآله وعلى بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين صاحب العص والزمان خليفة الرحمن إمام الإنس والجان ولعن الله وعداهم جمعين إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالحدى ودين الحق ليظهره على دين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا صدق الله العلي العظيم The privilege of faith has been our ongoing topic tonight is lecture number 4 Our discussion has been revolving around the importance of us understanding that what we believe in and the faith that has been given to us through Allah and through various wasilas like our parents is a privilege for us. And that privilege needs to be acted upon and it needs to be honored and needs to be appreciated. Not to be given away or sold out for a little bit of this dunya's tribulations. Last night we spoke a little bit about the mafhum or the understanding of the word privilege in this context. And we talked about the fact that yes, the word privilege right now is quite heavily used in the media. Whether you talk about the skin color of a certain individual or the gender of an individual, the various privileges are presented in front of you. But what I was speaking about and what I will continue to talk about is not this um, you know, undeserving advantage that is the definition of today's privilege. In fact, when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's a privilege based on two things. Number one, His grace. And number two, the potential for us to tap into that grace. I talked about last time how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed various avenues of guidance for us from the prophets to the imams to the marajid to our parents to the Quran to the ulama etc. etc. All these are various avenues of grace, grace and lutf of Allah for us to reach that ultimate level of perfection we talked about yesterday. In tonight's discussion... <clears throat> I want to examine a few verses of the Qur'an <clears throat> that look at reasons why sometimes we move away from the privilege, from this faith. While there are several reasons, part of it is how, I, how we react to what the dunya brings to us. Surah Hajj is the first verse I want to present to all of you, verse number 11. It's a very beautiful, very powerful verse. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing the state of those who believe. He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa min al-nasi man ya'abudullahu ala harf. That there are those amongst the men, amongst the people who worship Allah, and they worship Allah in the state of ala harf. Ala harf means on the edge of a cliff, or the edge of a boundary. Okay, and I want you to keep that image in mind for a moment. Because the verse goes on to say, فَإِنْ أَسَابَهُ خَيْرٌ إِتْمَأَ النَّبِيهِ وَإِنْ أَسَابَتْهُ فِطْنَةٌ إِنْ قَلَبَ عَلَى وَجْهِهِ خَسَرُ الدُّنْيَ وَلَاخِرَ ذَلِكَ هُوَ خُسْرَانُ الْمُبِينَ Okay. The verse says there are those who worship Allah on the edge of a cliff. And if you can picture somebody on the edge of a cliff, they're in a very vulnerable state. Okay, a little bit of a, of, of a slip here and there, and they're down the cliff. There are those, Allah says, who worship me in that state. A very vulnerable, a very volatile, a very sensitive state of worship. Where the Quran says that so long as there is khayr and good, 
Itma'annabi. They have mutma'in in their belief. They're comfortable with their belief. So long as Allah sends me khair and good, I'm fine. Nothing. I'm not going to question you. I'm not going to ask you why. I will serve you and worship you as you wish. So long as you bring about khair. khair. But however, it says, وَإِنْ أَسَابَتْهُمْ فِتْنَةٌ إِنْ قَلَبَ عَلَى وَجْهِهِ The moment a fitna comes to them, they turn their face away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A little bit of this world's test, and they turn their face away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. خَسَرَ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ they have lost the world, they have lost the akhirat as well. It's the ultimate loss. The biggest loss that you can lose is both worlds. People work usually for one world. This person who's worshipped Allah ala harf on the edge of a cliff has lost both worlds. And it's interesting to note in this verse that first of all, he's not talking about the munafiqeen, the kuffar, atheists, no. He's talking about those who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the mu'mineen, the abideen of Allah, but their worship is very, very volatile, number one. The point number two, which is very important, is that on one side, Allah says, فَإِنْ أَسَابَهُ خَيْرٍ If khayr comes to them, then they are, they are mutma'in. But the opposite, he does not say if shar comes to them. He says, if fitna comes to them, then they turn their face away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, the, the, the opposite of khair is evil. But here Allah says, there's two states that I put you in. Either khair or either fitna. And fitna in the Arabic word is not the Urdu word. Urdu word fitna means something negative. In the Quranic terminology, fitna means a test. So either I give you good, Allah says, or I give you a test. But the purpose of that test is to ultimately lead you towards good. So it's not the idea that Allah can send evil our way. No, now let's remove, that, remove from our, our minds this idea. But part of the reason why this privilege doesn't quite sit in with us is because our worship is very delicate. We've gone through a lot in this world. We've battled cancer, or we've seen our loved ones battle cancer, let's say, for example. We've gone through ugly divorces. We've seen our kids go through ugly divorces. We've lost our jobs. We've hit rock bottom. Whatever the case may be, this dunya has thrown everything at us. And the result should have been that we got stronger in our iman. Instead, we end up worshiping Allah ala harf, on the edge of a cliff. One more piece of bad news, Allah, and I'm out. And I've seen that. I've seen you know, some of our youth and our elders that a little bit of bad news, a broken engagement, you know, God forbid, a miscarriage or, or a loss of a job or a, bra- a wrong diagnosis, and now everything changes with, 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 with them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's pri- 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 precisely because they don't quite understand the purpose behind the test to begin with. And I, wanna, I want us to understand why is it that we don't tap into this privilege because we allow the dunya to change the way we see our faith. And we have to stop that. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Because we have to begin to accept the fact that this is how Allah does His kingdom. This is what He does. He tests us. This is how He allows us to know our level of iman. Okay, very openly, Surah Ankabut, He talks about this idea. Do you think that if you say, I believe, that you'll be left alone, that you won't be tested? And then He goes on to describe. There are those before you who we've tried. This idea of a test is nothing new to all of you. From Adam to the heavens all the way down to you and I. This is the way that Allah does it. This is his system of tests. We have to accept the fact that he will test us and continue to test us over and over and over again. And in his wisdom, he goes on to describe to us why does he test us. So we can understand what is it, Allah, that you want from us. In the very same verse of Surah Ankabut, he goes on to say, فَلَا يَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَلَا يَعْلَمَنَّ الْكَاذِبِينَ So that Allah can know those who are sadiq and those who are kadib. Those who are truthfully submitting to Allah and those who are lip-serving Allah. Saying, yes, Allah, لا إله إلا الله. The moment that a test comes, in قَلَبَ عَلَى وَجْهِهِ I turn my face away from Allah. Now, does that mean Allah doesn't know? No. He knows everything. He has the keys to the unseen. He's trying to tell us 
our level of iman. That litmus test, you know, that measuring stick, the fact that we can walk through the storm and get drenched at, after the storm of this, uh, of this world and still in the halat of being drenched from head to toe in this, in, this, uh, in this dunya, we can still say la ilaha illallah. That's the litmus test that he wants for you and I. That's how he knows. He can show us ourselves what the level of our iman is. Things are great when things are smooth. When things are a little bit rocky, then the true test comes about. He's telling us that, look, this expectation that we might have, that because you say la ilaha illallah, the storm might bypass you. Or the storm might drench everybody around you, but you are protected by this field. No. There will be a downpouring in this dunya. They'll throw every test at you. It will hit you just as it hits your neighbor who might be an atheist. The privilege of faith comes about when? When we're walking through that storm. Because the reality is that as you know, fitna in this world does not have any prejudice or bias. It's not like this dunya tests only those who say la ilaha illallah. No. You could have a neighbor who's an atheist who ridicules God, rejects Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but still he also went through a nasty divorce like you did perhaps. Or still his mother had cancer like your mother has cancer. Or still he lost his job like you lost your job. He might have had a, a miscarriage like you had a miscarriage. Meaning what? The dunya is not prejudice. The dunya equally tests and throws difficulties at everybody. The, diff the, the, the difference is the person going through that test. And that's where the privilege of faith comes about. Allah says, I will grant you the appropriate courage to walk through the storm. I won't promise you no storm. You'll get drenched. You'll get drenched. The atheist will, drench, will get drenched as well. But the issue is, I will give you the needed himmat and courage to walk through that storm. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now, I have a number of examples uh, to give you. The first one I want to uh, talk about is the mother of Nabi Musa. There are two emotions, please follow me very carefully. Two emotions in the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about constantly. Two specific emotions. One is khawf, fear. One is huzn, suffering or sadness. Okay. Of all the emotions that one insan goes through, these two seem to be an obsession by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And probably because, and many ulama have said this, probably because the idea is that these two emotions are those two emotions that can lead you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think about it for a moment. We are individuals, that, you know, we know some people who constantly are in a state of fear. Okay? If their kids are married, the fear is will they stay married? If the kids are married for three or four years, the fear is, can they have kids? If, if their kids have children, will their kids hold on to their iman in this Western world? Or this idea that if you have a, a parents who are older, you fear the day that your parent passes away. Or you fear the day that your parent has some sickness. Or there's a constant fear sometimes of your own job, or the job of your husband, or your wife, or your father, or your mother. Constant fear. There are people who actually are scared for other people's future. Has no control over it. But they're always scared about what will happen in that home or with this marriage. Allah, kya hoga? I have no idea what's going to happen there. So their BP goes up for other purposes. Right? And that's how people live their life. They search for reasons. They might be completely sukoon. Everything's going their way fine, but they're always on edge. They're waiting for the next thing to fall. They don't quite let their guard down for a moment. They are in constant fear that no, things are too good right now. I'm waiting for the next hit to happen. Then there are those who are suffering, who are in sadness, who don't quite let go of the tragedy that they have, that they have gone through. Whether it's a mother who's lost her child or a daughter who's lost her father or a wife who's lost her husband, whatever the case may be, there are certain tragedies in this world that simply don't leave you. And sometimes that sadness and that fear results in the idea of us moving away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These two emotions very specifically. Think about it. Sometimes a mother approaches her, her daughter, says, look, you're 31 now, you're 35 now, you're 43 now, everybody around you now has been married. 
Your sisters are, are married, your cousins are married, and you're the only one that wears hijab. Take the hijab off. I'm fearful that because of this hijab, nobody will marry you. So take it off, and the rishtas come, mashallah, like loads. Or I'm fearful that if I, you know, if, if I don't do this, then this will happen. And that fear kicks in when we start to actually move away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I don't want my son, Milan, to be too religious because he has to integrate into this American society. So I've had kids come to me and says, can you convince my parents to send me to Qum to study? Can you convince my parents to send me to Najaf to study? I want to go pursue the deen. If your son or your daughter being raised in the West ever comes to you and says, I want to go to the house of the study, you should fall into sujood at that moment. And thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the fear is that, number one, financially, what will happen? Number two, what if he gets too extreme, starts praying Fajr on time, starts fasting outside of, outside of Ramadan, oh my goodness. That fear now says, look, this much iman is good, not this much iman. And that fear begins to take you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's khawf, come to huzn. Grief is no different. How many times have you heard that when somebody goes through a very difficult tragedy, the first question is that they ask you, what's the point of all this? They ask me, what's the point of all this? I didn't miss one namaz, one amal. Every Monday I would fast. Shabi Qadr I was there. Shabi Nime Shaban I was there. Everything I was there. I did every amal bakhlus and still my husband was taken from me. And still my daughter's not getting married. Or you look at, for example, what's happening in Saudi right now. 37 people killed for no reason whatsoever. In Yemen and Bahrain, what's happening in Palestine, what's happening in Nigeria. And maybe the atheist might come to you at school or work and say, look, where's your God now? Your God's omnipotent, right? He's all-powerful. Why couldn't he stop you know, MBS from doing what he did in Saudi? And you might have an answer for him, but maybe in the heart of your hearts, you might think, you know what? Where is God right now? Why isn't he stopping all this? Why can't he stop what's happening in Yemen right now? And so that sadness, that grief of not only our daily life, but daily news pulls us away from the, from the privilege of the deen. And maybe that's why Allah, it seems as if, is consumed with khawf and huzn. Now come to the examples. Nabi Musa's mother. Beautiful story in Surah Qasas. All of you know it very, very well. But think about it from a human aspect. Sometimes we think, oh, that's the mother of a prophet. Wait a second now. She was a mother like anybody else was a mother. You know, I teach these kids every summer when I come for our camp here in, at Abid Duqaim. We always go through a discussion on, on aqaid and ideology and tawheed and we talk about this system called the fitrat of the insan, the innate disposition of the human being. Some things are innate and we teach God through the fitrat. One of the dalils that we have is through the fitrat. And I explain the fitrat by using one example every single time. And that is the, the, the love that the mother has for a child. That's what we call fitri. You can't teach that. You can't unlearn that. You can't, you know, sit there and force her. No, every mother on any stage loves her child at the innate level. That mother could be a masuma, like say the Fatima, or could be the mother of a prophet, like the mother of Musa, or could be your mother or my mother. That level of fitra doesn't change. Now come to Nabi Musa's mother. She's giving birth to a son at a time where Fir'aun has announced that any newborn son, I'm going to kill him. And he has killed before. And now she gives birth to her son. And news now has not reached Fir'aun's men. And now she has this newborn baby. And she's told through wahi by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to what? To place this newborn son of yours in a basket and put it down the river. Okay? We've heard the, th we've heard the story a thousand times. I asked my mothers who are listening, inshallah. How difficult must it be at a time where you know that your son has a huge target on his chest? That he is a, an enemy or a force against the biggest force right now of that time. And you're asked to place it inside of a basket, this child of yours, and put it down a flowing river. Not knowing if that basket might flip, if an animal might consume that child, if somebody might see that son and pick it off out of the ground. Uh, out of the water, or it might drown, or it might sink. You have no idea if that it will even float in the water. Nothing. You're told to put it in the water and forget about him. And the way the Quran describes that she put him in the water, فَأَلْقِهِ فِي الْيَمِّ 
فَأَلْقِهِ فِي الْيَمِي Meaning he, she didn't like, you know, place him down and send her khudafis, I love you, my son, and slowly, no. It was hectic, it was chaos. She could hear Fir'aun's men around her. It's almost as if, you know, with all due respect, she kind of pushed him into her and said, you know what, go. And she's watching her newborn son go down a very fast-flowing river. And the Quran says, فَأَلْقِهِ فِي الْيَمِي And then right away it says, فَلَا تَخَافِي don't fear and don't grieve. We will bring him back to you very, very shortly. Now you're asking the mother to not grieve or not fear. At that moment now, she must be shaking. She's a mother. She must be shaking. And that's why very few verses later, it talks about the state of the mother of Musa. And says there came a moment where the mother of Musa might have you know, lost her patience. Might have screamed that, look, that's my son going down that river. Somebody protect him, please. And then at that moment, the Quran says, Lola an rabatna ala qalbiha. Very carefully. Had it not been for the fact that we, what? We closed the heart of Nabi Musa's mother. She would have exposed Nabi Musa to be the son. And maybe he would have been killed. Rabatna meaning what? Look, when you have something that, that, that's about to break or about to explode, what do you do? You tie that around. You put a rope around it, and you kind of secure it from breaking, right? It's on the verge of cracking, and you kind of put a rope around it, or a cloth around it, or some glue, or something to tie it together to strengthen it. He says, look, Allah says, this heart of Nabi Musa's mother was about to burst. Was about to burst. We can tell her, don't fear and don't grieve. Allah says, ala We grabbed that heart, and we secured it. We said, look, I know it's difficult, it's a matter of a few moments. I'm telling you, by the time your son is ready for the next feed, you're going to feed your son. Just hold tight to that iman. Don't let go of that privilege based on fear and based on, uh, based on sadness. We will secure that heart for you. So when it comes to the privilege of faith, when it comes to walking through that moment where Allah says, don't grieve and don't be sad and don't fear, at the same time, Allah says, we also will what? We'll wrap your heart with the same himmat and courage you need to walk through that storm. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And again, you look at Ashab uh, Kaf, the story of, Surah, uh, uh, of these young individuals in the story of, Ka, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the people of the cave. These were young individuals, young, three, five, seven, whatever number it was the Quran says, that stood up against the zalim of their time, Correct? At a time where idol worshipping, where worshipping the king was very common. The thought of speaking of one Allah, one God, Tawheed, was unheard of back then. And here you have these young individuals with a lot of himmat, a lot of courage, stand in front of this king of their time, knowing full well, this this king can slit our throat in a blink of an eye. They They stand there and say, we reject your form of worship. We believe in one Allah who has no partners. And Allah says, how is it that these young men had the himmat and courage to stand there in the castle of this tyrant of a man and claim such a claim during that time? Again, Allah says, وَرَبَطْنَا عَلَىٰ قُلُوبِهِمْ إِذْ قَامُوا فَقَالُوا رَبُّنَا رَبُّ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ We are the ones that wrap that heart around it. We secured their heart. We gave that heart courage. We gave that heart pride. We gave that heart privilege. It could be strong. When they stood, they stood up against that king. They said, our Rabb is the Rabb of the heavens and the earth. It's not your idols. So again, as we walk through that storm, when Khawf and when Huzn can pull us away from that faith, it's Allah who says, look, I will not guarantee that you won't get drenched. You'll get drenched. But if you hold on to your faith and your iman, at that moment, believe me, I will give you that rabata around your heart that you need to walk through that storm. Such that when you are through that storm and you're drenched at the end of it, the atheist will blame Allah, you'll worship that same Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what we're after. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And that's why, again, we come to Surah Fusat. So many examples, so many examples. Khawf and Huzn, fear and suffering. Where Surah Fusat talks about 
those in the individuals. Inna ladina qalu Allah thumma staqamu. Beautiful verse. That for those who say that our Lord is Allah. Okay. Surah Fusat, verse number 30, I believe. Inna ladina qalu rabbuna Allah thumma staqamu tatanazzulu alayhimu al-malaika. That if there are individuals who not only verbalize that Allah is one, but thumma staqamu, and they stand on the path, they stay firm, they don't move, they don't bend, they don't apologize, they don't let go of that privilege, they don't sell that privilege for this dunya. If they can do all of that with the verbalizing of la ilaha illallah, Allah says, tatanazzulu alayhimul malaika. Angels come down on them with three pieces of news. Again, think about what I'm saying. What are those three? Allah takhafu. Don't fear. Wala tahzanu. Don't grieve. Wa abshiru al bijannati allati kuntum tu'adun. And accept the bashara, the good news of jannah which you have been promised. Again, those two emotions come about. The idea of huzn and khawf. Fear and suffering or fear and sadness. Allah says, look, if you claim that Allah is one, and all of us do, but the true test comes in thum mastaqamu, when that storm hits. And we're right now in the eye of the storm. And many of you right now looking at me are right now in the eye of your storm. You come in this, in this room, you put on a brave face, you say salam to me, huge smile, you greet me, you hug me. But who knows what's happening inside the heart of your hearts? What's happening? I don't know. A lot of my sisters on that side are quietly suffering. Nobody knows but them. And they stop and they think, you know, what will happen to me? Will I be able to walk through that storm? And that's when the privilege of faith comes about. It's that faith that, yes, gives you that storm so you can find out you're a Qadib or a Sadiq, but also gives you that Rabbata that you need to walk through that storm. That same Rabbata of the Ashab Kaf, of the mother of Nabi Musa, and of those who say, Qalu Rabbanullah. So these two emotions are extremely important. It's these, two, it's these two emotions that pull us away from this faith and this privilege. Part of the reason why a lot of my youth today are questioning the very deen that all of you spend your time in giving them, it's because they see all the hardships in this world and all the difficulty that they're going through. And they wonder how could Islam be so difficult? And my question to them is when were you ever guaranteed an easy life when you said la ilaha illallah? Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam. He says to his Shias many, many times, and the Imam, several, several of them have quoted this, that if you claim that you love us, if you claim that we are the hujat of Allah, if you accept ghadir, then be ready for a life of hardships. We have to understand the hikmat behind Allah's hardships and not use it as an avenue to move away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you have that fear, and, and we all have fear, we all have fear, there's always a cloud of fear over us. A lot of my elders are very fearful what's gonna happen to our generation 20 years from now, and they should be, rightfully so. I have young kids, I'm equally scared. We can do everything we can, but ultimately it has to come from within them. There is this fear that what will happen to our centers and our masajid, there's a fear what will happen to our ummah, etc., et all this. And ultimately, there's a fear of death and a fear of the day of judgment. Every breath we take, every day that we live, we're closer to that reality that sometimes we can't even discuss. So fear is everywhere. And huzn is also everywhere. This dunya does not leave you alone for one second. It's made specifically to test you and to show you the state of your iman. But it is, it is during those very, very, you know, delicate moments of the ultimate level of fear and ultimate level of sadness that Allah says that you will walk away from me. Think about it. When it comes to emotions in general, just two more minutes, inshallah. When it comes to emotions in general, when it comes to fear, sorry, when it comes to sadness, when it comes to happiness, us celebrating something and us grieving something, sometimes we go to two extremes. Hadith says that Allah tests us the most at our highest level of khushi and our highest level of gham. Our highest level of happiness and our highest level of sadness. Ki mulana, eki beti do hai mulana. It's only one, I only have one daughter. It's her wedding. 
let me press pause on, on the VCR of my dean. Let me put on a full-fledged wedding. There are people coming from India, from the US, from Australia. You know, let me put on a bash, and I can press play on the, on, on the button afterwards. And the dean doesn't have a play and pause button, I'm sorry. It doesn't. Or sometimes when we are riddled with Imam Hussein's gham, and we have a lot of issues with the way the marajah tell us how to grieve for Imam Hussein. And we challenge our marajah when it comes to Imam Hussein. He's my mullah, let me grieve the way I want to grieve. And while the grief is a very personal journey towards you and, and Imam Hussein, but ultimately when it comes between your grief and the deen's image, the deen's image takes afzal over your grief. It's not this idea where you can now all of a sudden now are you, you and your grief are over the image of the deen. I'm sorry. That's not how it works. Imam Hussein says, look, take, take my entire life, take every ounce of my Ali Asghar, but the deen has to remain where it is. And now we're going to grieve towards that same mullah by taking the deen all the way down and allowing our grief. No, it doesn't work like that. I'm sorry. Nor does it work for us to have ghar ki shadi, ghar ki khushi, but we have, mashallah, every rule of the deen is thrown out the window. Let's be careful. These are emotions Allah recognizes are very, very strong inside of us. But those are the same emotions that pull us away from that privilege of the faith that Allah has given. It's a privilege for us to believe in what we believe in. For no other reason, Allah says, you strengthen your faith, the, 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 the storms will come. But the stronger your faith is, the more I'll be there with you. Don't worry about it. I've been there with those before you. I'll be, I'll be there with you as well. Many of my elders can probably tell me a thousand stories of difficulties that you had to go through where you thought, you know what? I'm not going to last this difficulty. There's no way. I'm done with this one. This is going to kill me. It never kills you. You only get stronger. Your faith gets stronger. And now you laugh at the dunya. Say, what will it give me? Cancer? Give me cancer. I'll beat it. What's it going to give me? It's going to give me some miscarriage? No problem. No problem. We've, we, we've dealt with things that are worse. And that's what it is. As your faith gets stronger, Allah says you also get stronger as well. Your himmat gets stronger as well. The storm comes, no doubt. And the storm comes harder for a mu'min. But your rabata, your himmat, your courage also gets stronger as well. Think of the mother of Musa. Think of those young, young individuals in the Ashab of, uh, uh, of Kaf. Think about Bibi Zainab in the courtyard of Yazid, looking at this man in the eye and saying that the offspring of Shaitan are born inside of people like you, Yazid. Imagine the himmat of Bibi Zainab. To sit there in the darbar of Yazid, in his own home court, in front of his followers, and tell him that you breed Satan's children. It's very difficult to say that. But that's what it is. The level of faith was incredible. Sometimes I picture this idea. One last point in Tamas Dua. Sometimes I picture Bibi Zainab. Shame Gariba. The tents are on fire. The tents are now placed out of fire. And the reports say that she's looking behind the khayma. Everything is settled now. The enemy is gone. The tents are now extinguished. Everything is gone. And she's looking for a place behind the tents. And the Ravi says, I wasn't sure what she was doing until I realized that behind the burnt tents, she's looking for a place in the middle of the night on Shami Gariba to pray Salatul Layl. That level of worship... That level of grief, we hear about the Messiah and our heart breaks. She was there in Mojur until Zainabiyah. And still that night that Hussein was killed, she's looking for a spot amongst the ashes to thank her Lord. That's the privilege of faith that we need to adopt. And when it comes to Huzan, when it comes to Khawf, we ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our qaleel ibadat insha'Allah. We ask you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's so much tyranny, injustice, oppression all over the world. We ask you, Allah, to weaken the hands of the enemies of Islam, inshallah, to strengthen the mustazah afin all over the world. And finally, Allah, this is the month of Ramadan. We ask you, Allah, to forgive our sins and those of our parents, inshallah. We ask you, Allah, make us isqabil of Imam Zaman al Zuhur and make us his ashab when he comes. Thank you very much. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.